Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from LaRouche Pack with your daily update for today, September 8th, 2020. 98 years ago, Lyndon LaRouche was born in Rochester, New Hampshire. Uh, he would be 98 today, and I'm going to take this opportunity to discuss the present economic situation from looking at some of the work that Lyndon LaRouche has done, or actually looking at it from his standpoint as the foremost physical economist, the foremost promoter of the ideas of the American system uh, from the last century, going back to perhaps Lincoln, McKinley, to some extent what Franklin Roosevelt did. But Lyndon LaRouche was unique as a political figure and as an economist. And to look through his eyes at a report just, that just came out yesterday, it gives us an insight as to what needs to be done, but also the unique particular genius of Lyndon LaRouche. Now, here's the report I'm talking about. Uh, we have repeatedly emphasized that it was not the coronavirus lockdown that created this economic crisis. The economic crisis, in a sense, goes back to the 2001 George W. Bush policies, uh, the bubble policies of Alan Greenspan that were continued by Bernanke and Yellen and now by Jay Powell. The idea that you solve an economic problem, which is really a collapse of physical production, that you solve it by printing money. It's an absurd idea. It's something that Lyndon LaRouche was attacking back in the 60s when people like Arthur Burns and others were proposing to Nixon that in the face of a dollar crisis, an international crisis, which was provoked by the British Empire, that in the face of that, you separate the dollar from a gold reserve basis, you end the fixed exchange system, and go into a floating rate system, which is favorable to speculation, favorable to large financial uh, wealth, people who are extremely wealthy who can use that wealth to buy and sell stocks and securities, and the ones who are the really big ones with connections to the city of London and Wall Street can destroy national economies by shorting their currencies or speculating on their currencies, which was opened by that August 15, 1971 decision, which Lyndon LaRouche alone identified as a turning point in modern history. Now, what do we see from this new report today? Well, as I said, the coronavirus lockdown is not the cause of this crisis. That is a trigger to an escalation. But this became evident in August and September of last year, 2019, with the collapse of the, the repurchase markets, the repo markets, the overnight lending markets, which banks and other shadow banking institutions needed to cover loans and, and debts coming due over a 24-hour period. It was in the middle of September 2019 that the Federal Reserve took over the repo markets because the commercial banks would no longer do so. They no longer trusted the securities they were given in return for their loans. They feared a domino-style collapse, and they figured that they didn't want to be trapped in that, especially with the huge volumes of derivatives and other uh, bad corporate debt and, and securities that they were holding. They left it to the Federal Reserve to come up with the funds. And so what we've seen is the Fed taking over the repo market and then introducing all kinds of new mechanisms, which essentially are quantitative easing mechanisms, uh, policies to pump more money into the economy. Now, credit is needed. We do need huge amounts of credit today for things such as infrastructure, if we're going to modernize and upgrade manufacturing and industry in the United States, protect the agricultural sector, uh, and develop infrastructure, we need credit. But we don't need liquidity pumping, the plunge protection team, as it became known, I believe, during the Clinton period. So what we're seeing is all forms of, of quantitative easing that are going where? Where is this new liquidity going? including the liquidity that was voted up or that was supported with the CARES Act, the so-called Coronavirus Relief Fund. Well, the 
it's going into deposits in the six to eight largest banks in the United States. It's not going into the small businesses, the mom and pop stores. It's not going to innovators. It's not going to uh, industrial corporations for uh, in investment in industry. They're getting some of that money through their relationship with the largest banks, but that money is going to buy stocks. It's going to keep the value of their existing stocks up. It's going into new corporate bonds, which provide funds for what? For buying their stocks. And so we're seeing a huge stock bubble. Now, here are some of the figures on this. The total deposits in banks in July 2019 was 12 trillion 830 or 12.836 trillion dollars. That's the total deposits. By August of 2020, 13 months later, it's now 15.625 trillion, up almost three trillion dollars. The why are the deposits going up so much? At the same time, loans are dropping. The amount of banks' uh, assets in loans is dropping. So they're, they're accumulating money. Now, what are they doing with that? And especially, by the way, industrial loans are dropping. We have a need for investment in industry, but it's not happening. Now, much of this credit is being used to buy stocks and real estate. The, and cash assets. Cash assets in banks are up 75%. That means they're hoarding the cash. For what reason? Because they know that much of what they're holding as assets in securities and stocks and bonds are worthless and could be part of triggering a domino-style collapse. So out of the total outstanding bank credit, 30% now is in securities or stocks and bonds and 32% in real estate. Now, is this affecting all banks? No. The biggest banks, six or so of the largest banks, the ones you know by name, JP Morgan Chase, Citibank, Bank of America, have two thirds of the deposits and assets of the total banking system. And they're using that to make profits through trading. That is, they're buying and selling financial instruments that they know have very little intrinsic value. That's called a bubble. And that's what we're seeing in the so-called recovery that's underway, a stock market bubble. Now, the problem with this goes back to what? This goes back to what was built up in 2008. The mortgage-backed security bubble in which the shadow banking system because the repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1999 meant that you could intermingle funds of deposits in the commercial banks with speculative investments. And so this new pool of liquidity was used to create something called mortgage-backed securities, where there was a huge lending operation that was designed to bolster the profits of the, the lenders, that is the big banks, by creating a, a real estate bubble, which was designed to collapse, which they knew would collapse. And when it finally collapsed, it nearly brought down the whole banking system. Now at that point, what Lyndon LaRouche said was necessary was to put the whole thing through a bankruptcy reorganization, go back to Glass-Steagall, end this policy of intermingling funds between commercial banks, investment banks, the completely unregulated shadow banking system dominated by the city of London. All of that should have been shut down at the time. There were uh, people in Congress proposing to do that. But at the time, in 2008, remember there was an election, McCain and Obama were brought in and both of them, McCain reluctantly, but McCain and Obama supported the bailout policies of Bush, Cheney, and Hank Paulson and of course, uh, what was done by Bernanke at the Federal Reserve. And so a new bubble was created. That is, the speculators were not punished, but homeowners who were trapped in these mortgages, the interest-free mortgages, by which it meant you didn't pay interest until all of a sudden you got hit with a huge interest bill. Seven to eight million families lost their homes. 
Businesses were shut down. Industries collapsed. But the bubble grew. The so-called recovery of Obama was a bubble. And when that bubble looked like it was petering out, it was again reinvigorated, especially through Jerome Powell and others with this latest policy of the new quantitative easing. So instead of putting things through a bankruptcy reorganization, instead of re-regulating the banks with a Glass-Steagall legislation, instead of a national credit policy that directs credit not to a speculative bubble, but to real physical production, we've had bubble after bubble after bubble. And that bubble is going to pop. And so the fact that the banks are sitting there with all this cash backing up the worthless assets that they've been buying and selling is not a sign of a recovery. It's a sign of a continuing bit of idiocy that rejects the fundamentals of physical economy. So I would recommend to people that you dig into the works of Lyndon LaRouche. There's one behind me, The Economics of the Noosphere. He's written about how you can expand credit without causing inflation. There are so many articles by LaRouche over the years on physical economy, on the American system, on how we create value through human creativity, and that new discoveries in science lead to new technologies which cheapen the cost of production, which increase what was known to Hamilton and others as the power of labor. That is, each worker employed in these new tech, using these new technologies can increase the amount of physical goods production, which is necessary for the whole of society. That's real economics. So to celebrate Lyndon LaRouche's 98th birthday, and while he's no longer here with us physically, his ideas and his mind still are with us. And we should take advantage of that before it's too late to address a crisis which is continuing from the beginning of this century under the Bush policy, the Obama policy, and the inability of the Congress to work with President Trump to reverse it by restoring Glass-Steagall, restoring a credit policy, investing in infrastructure, and so on. So thank you for joining me today, and I'll be back with you tomorrow.